My name's Stephen Duckett. I'm the Director of the Health Program at the Grattan Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this uh, webinar today about COVID-19 and the, the future of the health system uh, in the post-COVID environment. I'd like to start by acknowledging that where I'm sitting here at home is the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and especially to any Indigenous Australians who are here watching us today. Uh, so today we're having two speakers, myself, uh, talking about some of the work we've done here at Grattan and Dr. Theresa Anderson, who's the Chief Executive of South, South Sydney Local Health District. And uh, she'll be talking about some of the work they've done at Sydney Local Health District, including some of the, the quite exciting stuff they've done about virtual hospitals or a virtual hospital, I suppose. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, so I will start, if I can get my screen share to work. To talk about what should be different in the post in the post pandemic. Now, uh, just to start, this is where we are on the COVID-19 response. It's been a relatively short period that we've all experienced. And what you can see is that Australia actually started quite well and quite early with blocking of arrivals from China. And but that early containment strategy sort of became a bit more uncertain over time. We're quite unclear. And we actually, I think, dropped the ball in some aspects in f failing to uh, control the borders with Iran and Italy uh, soon enough. Um, and we slowly, you know, the, the pandemic started to escalate, mostly with international arrivals. Uh, and we started to go through the uh, shutdowns and the, the, the different states, especially New South Wales and Victoria, led in terms of uh, restrictions on our everyday life. And that, of course, started to change the dynamic. Instead of exponential growth, we had negative exponential decline in the number of uh, daily new cases. And we're now moving to the final stage of transition. But really, the question we have to ask is, uh, what are we transitioning to? And in particular, and that's what we're going to talk about today, but in particular, what we need to know, what we need to realise is this won't be automatic. We have to make conscious decisions about what is going to happen and what are we going to learn from in this new, in the pandemic. So uh, there are seven lessons that uh, we've identified here at Grattan. Uh, that, the, that are based on the way things changed during the pandemic. And so I'll briefly run through each of those. Then I'll hand over to Teresa to talk about the Sydney Local Health District experience, and then we'll have questions. And so you'll notice in the, um, on, the, on the Zoom, you've probably all done webinars before, there's a Q&A section, there's also a chat section. Uh, you can use either and uh, we'll be looking at the answering those questions uh, after we've finished our presentations. But the first of the lessons to be learned is about telehealth. And this, this is data from uh, Melbourne mostly uh, and Gippsland. It's about what, what was the transition, what happened in the early stages of the pandemic. And you can see that face-to-face -face, uh, consultations, this is general practice consultations, face-to-face -face consultations started to decline quite quickly and uh, telehealth, mostly telephone consultations, started to increase. And so we had a quite dramatic change in the way uh, general practice services and subsequently other services were being provided. And so the first lesson we have to think about is what do we do about it? Now, the telehealth item numbers were introduced, I think, without much thought. They just simply mirrored the initially the general practice items and then the specialist items, the consultation items, the attendance items. And I think that this exposed uh, or, or reinforced, I don't think, necessarily desirable forms of practice. And so in my view, what we should be looking at is in the post-pandemic world, 
we should be looking at new, we should definitely be keeping telehealth, definitely be keeping telehealth. It's uh, a much more efficient way. I mean, the, the anecdotes are that there are re reductions in no-shows, for example, and patients love it and it can be done very efficiently. But the question is, what sort of health system do we want to encourage with this? Because there can be some perverse uh, incentives. And so what we're suggesting is that really what we want telehealth to do is build on an established relationship with the practice. Now, we haven't been to define that very well, but what we're saying is that, you know, this should be part of a person's relationship with their practice, their general practice, and it should be certainly fu uh, funded, but you might say, you can't just um, set up a clinic and just say, we're going to run in everything by telehealth uh, without having any form of face-to-face -face initial contact, without any assessment and so on. And in the last budget, the government introduced a, uh, in a sense, a capitation payment or enrolment fee for people over 70. And we think that part of enrolling would mean you get access to the telehealth items. So what we're saying is, yes, do telehealth, but do it differently. We're also suggesting a big bulk build, and we also suggest you need to think very carefully about when telehealth is the right, the right solution and how you make sure that uh, people who may have less access to uh, video and so on have access to telehealth. And you need to actually make sure that the, the, the funding arrangements all work and so on uh, for this. Now, one of the interesting things that happened here in Australia was that uh, because of the way the MBS is structured, everything, the, the general practice response, especially the primary care response, had to all be done by GPs. In contrast, in the United Kingdom, for example, they were able to set up drive-through clinics staffed by nurses, whereas we, uh, because doctors get remunerated on a fee-for-service basis, they were the ones who took the swabs and so on. Now, what we're saying is, was that really efficient? You know, should we have stepped back and said, is that the right way? And we're, we're arguing that there might be new ways of looking at uh, should the MBS be changed to allow a bit more flexibility in who provides services. This is something Teresa is going to talk about, but dramatic change uh, in hospital in the home, uh, outpatient, telehealth outpatient services, rehab in the home, so what happened was we saw a change in the balance of risk. Uh, people were reluctant to go out. People were reluctant to go to hospital, even for, for get their dialysis or get their um, chemotherapy. And many hospitals pivoted. So chemotherapy started to be, the chemo in the home started to increase dramatically. Medibank, I think, also introduced uh, chemo in the home funding uh, during this period. And so... This is fantastic, and I think part of the future should be a massive uh, building on what we saw here in the pandemic, a, an increase in um, hospital and home rehab and the home and so on. Similarly, there's been, and, and I should say about hospital and the home, we also need to develop that in a way that engages the, the person's general practitioner so that they can also be part of this uh, planning and service. And, of course, in some cases, if it's hospital and home, uh, the GP can't build Medicare, so they should be paid by the hospital. But you might also build on the, the facilitate home-based care by making sure that we're able to fund telemonitoring appropriately and primary care outreach. So, and again, in Victoria, there are a number of community health centres which uh, started outreach programs, you know, ringing up patients at home to see how they're going, were they keeping on their meds and all those sorts of things. And so really quite good. Um, and the some of these things, um, some of the public hospital funding arrangements might inhibit this, uh, and especially uh, services in residential aged care and uh, telemonitoring. So um, we're... During the pandemic, the private hospital system basically shut down um, and developed a big backlog of uh, patients awaiting elective surgery, and the same thing happened in the public sector. So as we are opening up, reopening elective procedures, uh, we've got to think about what sort of future, what sort of new normal do we want? 
And we've got this big backlog of people who would have been otherwise would have been admitted for elective procedures in the last dec- in the last ten weeks. What are we going to do to open up and address that? Are we? And I think part of the answer should be uh, possibly using private facilities. I think part of the answer is going to be let us think about whether the way we run elective procedures in this country in each state is right. And I think you know you might like to look you might like to think about more consolidated waiting lists. So instead of each uh, health service having its own waiting list, you might say, well, uh, could we consolidate and have a single waiting list for all of Sydney or all of Melbourne or just the southern part of Sydney or the southern part of Melbourne and just think about making sure that there's consistent assessment process that if you see surgeon A and you've got exactly the same symptoms and exactly the same experience of those symptoms and that you will be categorised as a two or a three, and if you go to a different surgeon, you'll still get the same categorization. So consistent categorization, consistent prioritization, consistent care path, the appropriate care path in terms of the workforce, and so on. And we we haven't done that and we don't do it now. And so it's not best practice in the way we manage elective procedures, but we should take this opportunity to say, let's look at things totally different in the way we manage elective procedures. And similarly, we should be empowering private hospitals to do the same. Private hospitals. There's been a massive growth in inpatient rehab, day patient rehab in private sector. Is that the right thing when the evidence is that they rehab at home for many patients is just as good? Um, our public health planning wasn't as good as it should have been. Our pandemic planning, even though we've had plan- pandemic plans in place, we didn't necessarily have them as uh, they didn't necessarily look at the governance arrangements, national cabinet wasn't contemplated, the Commonwealth, one of the Commonwealth pandemic plans was pretty much oriented towards the Commonwealth and didn't look at the states really at all. Um, we've got the the um, the plans ended with the phase down and didn't, didn't think about a, a second wave, for example. We know there are secondary effects, so I'll come back to that, of the pandemic in terms of mental health ne- uh, needs and so on. Um, we didn't have the right systems in place. We had to do uh, changes to regulations, sort of, should they have been planned a bit earlier. So we and what the second dot point there is an important one. There was basically no national information for the first couple of weeks because we we have and we still have inconsistent definitions of what an active case is between the states. We still uh, we initially the data set was the best data set was combined by the Guardian or or, um, you know, so we didn't have a really good publicly available national data set about what was happening, and that's ridiculous. In terms of the um, secondary wave, this is information about bushfires, but the same is true if you look at floods or in any other crisis situation. And what we see here in this study was that people in areas which were highly affected by bushfires have higher levels of depression, higher levels of severe distress, higher levels of heavy drinking, higher levels of PTSD and so on. And so we should be expecting and anticipating that a similar response that we saw in this bushfire crisis or a flood crisis, there's going to be similar level, there's going to be increased uh, demand on our mental health services and we've got to think about how we're going to respond to that. Now, some of that might be tele-mental health, but we've got to think about, and this ought to be part of the plan, but so what we're arguing back here is that the, the pandemic planning, the phase down fa- um, phase of the, of the pandemic plan should not only think about how we stop doing all the things we're doing and how we uh, change the way the, the what is the ongoing level of PPE, what's the ongoing, when are we going to restart the procedures and so on. But we also need to be thinking about second wave of mental health and uh, alcohol and drug issues, and that ought to be part of our pandemic planning. Obviously, we had problems right from the start about uh, test kits, PPE, um, and that really uh, made the initial responses quite difficult. and so there are issues about the supply chain. Now, the supply chain is actually not easy to address. Uh, we're never going to produce everything in Australia that we're going to need. 
So we've got to think about how do we manage the supply chain? It's not simply, oh, let's produce everything here. Um, there might be some of that. We might put a price premium on local production, but that's not going to be the only answer. So some of the answer is going to be about how we actually uh, make suppliers accountable for the supply chain. New Zealand, for example, that's what they do. They say it's your job to make to guarantee a supply. And so they've, they've actually in their contracts with their suppliers, they've put obligations on the suppliers uh, to actually ensure resilience of the supply chain. And similarly, we could look at product standardisation and flexibility and all those sorts of things. Obviously, another issue was the, the stockpile. It didn't have the right stuff in it, so we've got to be thinking about how we, we, we address all of those things into the future. Finally, we saw real problems in terms of Commonwealth state roles. Um, so, you know, the National Cabinet was an important innovation, but it came about because the Prime Minister realised that he didn't have the power to do some of the things that he wanted to do. And, he, and in order to deal himself in to having a say in lockdowns, for example, he had to deal the Premiers in because it's the Premier's decision. The reason I'm sitting in my office now is that the Victorian Deputy Chief Health Officer, in my home now, is the Victorian Deputy Chief Health, Health Officer has signed a, an order saying I've got to stay inside if I can. And so it's a state decision about lockdowns. And so the Commonwealth were basically innocent bystanders and, and they, if they wanted to have a say, they had to have a national cabinet. On the other hand, the Commonwealth, the states were able to respond very quickly, not only in terms of the lockdown issues, but in terms of the delivery. States have a hierarchical relationship with hospitals and they could direct the hospitals. You know, if they, if the, if the uh, New South Wales uh, Director General says to Theresa, you've got to jump, Theresa's answer is how high. The, in the, the Commonwealth, they do not have a hierarchical relationship with anything. It's all a market relationship. The relationship with the general practice, with medical services is entirely a fee-for-service basis. So when the Commonwealth says, jump, the pathologist replied, how much are you going to pay me to jump? And this led to negotiations where the fee for a pathology test went up fivefold uh, so that the pathologist would deliver because it was entirely a market relationship. It meant the Commonwealth's response was much slower than the state's response on the ground. The Commonwealth, for example, promised 100 uh, testing clinics and they delivered but they delivered more or less when the pandemic was over. We were in the declining phase, whereas the state clinics were established much quicker. So we've got to think about what on earth this means for how we're actually going to get the Commonwealth and the state to work together. And we argue that, you know, you've got to, the Commonwealth has got to work more closely with the states. The states have the feet on the ground. How is that going to happen? And we think part of that answer is working through the PHNs, the primary healthcare networks. And I should declare an interest here that I chair the board of the Eastern Melbourne PHN here in Melbourne. And so we've got to be thinking about how we actually set up relationships, which means that the Commonwealth and the state can work together, build cooperation on the ground and build coordination. Now, I'll stop there. I won't, I won't actually move to questions. I will actually move to uh, Teresa. Uh, Theresa, as I said right at the start, is the Chief Executive of the Sydney Local Health District. She's been in that role almost a decade, since 2011. She joined there straight from school by the look of her. <laughs> and um, so she's going to talk about some of the exciting things that, uh, that she did there. Thanks very much, Theresa. Thank you so much, Stephen. And uh, it's great to join you today. And I too will begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I meet, um, the Gadigal people of the great Eora Nation, and to pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, uh, and all Aboriginal people who are joining us today. And, and I do think that in our response to COVID, one of the things that we have done well in our district is working in partnership with our Aboriginal brothers and sisters to make sure that uh, we address their needs um, as well as the needs of the broader community. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to share some of the things that we've been doing in Sydney Local Health District in response to COVID. And as you said, Stephen, there's many uh, lessons that we've all learnt from this. Um, 
and one is the need for partnership. And if I think about what's worked well for us, it's really about having both uh, strong local governance um, within the local health district, but as you said, very much embedded into what the state is doing. And very early on in the COVID response, I have to say New South Wales Health um, acted as a state. We all got together, all of the chief executives and the pillars and the secretary and executive um, to plan what we were going to do going uh, forward. I think one of the advantages that we do have in our district is that we've got a very ex experienced team um, who are able to activate the pandemic response really quickly and effectively. And we've learned over the years that uh, frequent communication with our staff at all levels is absolutely critical. Um, and I do believe that that was one of the pillars that enabled us to act very quickly um, in response to COVID and some of the more innovative things that we've done within the district. Um, workforce engagement, as you know, is absolutely critical at these points. And there has been a lot of work done within the district, but also across the state to make sure that we continue to have high levels of engagement um, with our staff, because we've asked our staff, Stephen, to do things that they never thought they were going to do. I mean, we run hotels. I mean, who would have thought? Um, but not your normal hotel. Um, we have deployed, seconded, redesigned very quickly our staff to do activities that none of us thought were going to, um, to be possible. Uh, we introduced RPA Virtual uh, Hospital um, and we introduced it as a hospital with a proper governance structure and appropriate um, processes which include um, having um, protocols and processes for the different types of patients uh, that we have come across, both um, those who are COVID positive, um, but also those who've got other complications that are impacted by COVID in the community. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go. But um, in uh, October last year, um, I was uh, on a trip to Israel uh, with the Secretary of New South Wales um, and I texted my staff saying, we actually need to have RPA Virtual up and running by the third, by the end of January 2020, at which I think my staff thought that they would kill me. Um, and I'm really glad that we decided to do that because without RPA Virtual, it would have been very difficult for our district to address the challenges that we had. And, and as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, Stephen, you talked about the importance of collaboration and certainly um, what has worked for us is the intensive collaboration between our hospital and community specialists, which has enabled us to develop safe and effective virtual models of care, which um, have great acceptance by the people that we are providing those services to. Um, and critical expertise um, provided confidence necessary um, to deliver this without a, a normal blueprint. Um, and, you know, it, it is being able to pull on the resources um, of a big tertiary hospital like RPA, but also the other resources that we have in our other hospitals um, to support RPA virtual. Um, very much also having local ICT services that are ready to innovate and support the rapid design um, of our clinical services and working shoulder to shoulder with the clinicians. Um, we're actually, we launched on the 3rd of February. Um, we're about to accept our thousandth patient um, for RPA virtual, which I think when you think that it's only really been in 16 weeks of operation is no mean feat. Um, Consultation across primary health care, uh, across our specialists has been really critical in making sure that we've got a really robust model of care with algorithms for particular cohorts of patients. And we've taken a cohort approach um, to the way in which we're managing care. And this is just a little example um, of our registrations and occasions of service uh, going through to May. And as you can see, it's been pretty exponential growth um, across the district. Um, and 
uh, we've gone from having two virtual pods to now 19 virtual pods um, and we function 24 hours a day mm -hmm. like um, a standard hospital. Uh, why isn't that going to the next one? There we go. Um, so what what's worked for us? Um, <laughs> we, uh, on the 27th of um, March, got a call saying... Uh, we have an issue about where we're going to put people who need to be quarantined, um, who are um, symptomatic. And uh, so within two days, we established uh, health um, accommodation, health hotels, um, and they needed to be supported. Uh, and RPA Virtual uh, took on that um, activity. Um, one of the things that we've done which has been really successful in having a new model of care is around the establishment of tiger teams um, that have gone out across the hospitals um, but also supporting RPA virtual in the community um, for both people at home but also in the health accommodation about the correct use of PPE. And when you think in our health accommodation that we're dealing with, with one of the lo largest cohorts of people who are COVID positive, making sure that we get that right has been really uh, fundamental to us. Um, our special health accommodation, our health hotels, as I said, I, I've become a hotelier, Stephen. Um, never thought that would happen. Um, but we've had to do that in a way um, that isn't about substandard care. This is about providing care in the community uh, in a way that doesn't put um, undue pressure on our hospital system at a time that we're trying to triple and quadruple our intensive care capacity, but making sure that those people who can be effectively managed outside of hospital can be um, in a safe and high quality way and ensuring that the public health risk of transmission is um, minimised. We also, you talked about... Um, uh, having GPs undertake screening in New South Wales, we've uh, deployed fly, flying squads um, of uh, nurses um, to our cruise ship terminals, the airport, patients' home, residential aged care facilities, our drive-in um, uh, swabbing stations throughout the community for us to um, be able to get swabbing done in a very fast and convenient way for our community. And the fact that we have... Um, over a 1,000 people a day being um, uh, screened and swabbed in the community, I think is a demonstration that we can do things really quite differently. But you mentioned about partnerships and partnerships with local council, the social care sector, our community organisations have enabled us to access pop-up uh, our vulnerable communities um, in ways that we probably thought were not possible. And um, I have to say, I was really um, uh, chuffed when at one of our boarding houses, and in, we're in the centre of Sydney, so we have very large boarding houses. 47% of the state's boarding houses are in our district with some of the most vulnerable communities. Um, and they actually gave our staff a standing ovation for the care that they were given um, around screening and swabbing and make sure, making sure that they were looked after and ensuring that we had a results hospital hotline to support um, individuals who are waiting for um, their swab results. Uh, this is a bit of a journey um, in our special health accommodation of being able to surge up and surge down. And you can see that we hibernate some of the apartments for short periods and then we put them back out um, as the, um, uh, the volume of people who come through the airport requiring accommodation um, increases and decreases. This is just... Um, a little uh, slide on um, some of the numbers that we're having through the district. We've um, had over 44,000 people within Sydney Local Health District tested for COVID. Um, as you can see, um, we have uh, housed in our special health accommodation 680 uh, people, but we have a very strong relationship with the, um, with the police accommodation to make sure that they... Uh, anyone who is identified as symptomatic and um, being COVID positive is transferred to the health accommodation. One of the things that we were worried about uh, when we introduced uh, the virtual hospital at scale um, was around the experience of our consumers and what we've identified um, in um, our patient reported measures um, is that 
uh, our patients actually feel really confident in knowing that their symptoms are being regularly monitored by RPA virtual. Because uh, as I said, it's set up as a proper hospital with proper ward rounding, with case conferencing, um, with integration with our um, with our clinicians across uh, across the hospital and in the community. 89% of um, our consumers actually said that the technologies, they found the technologies that were used by RPA virtual, including pulse oximeters, et cetera, improved their access to care and treatment. And this also included older people. So we have a basic assumption that older people are not going to use these technologies and we're finding that that assumption is incorrect. Um, 72% found the wearables uh, easy to use and we've certainly got our model in terms of um, the Tiger teams to make sure that people are aware of how to use uh, these models. Um, and video conferencing is central to any virtual care model. And as you said, um, Stephen, this is not just about um, substituting one model for another, it's how we integrate um, virtual healthcare into our normal models of care. And 71% of our patients found it easy to use all of the time. Um, our patients have loved this. Um, we've been uh, really um, very chuffed by the amount of feedback, positive feedback that we've had. Um, and I think the daily check-ins, even when people were in isolation, really demonstrated um, that our patients don't feel abandoned um, and I think that's a really important point. We're very pleased that uh, we actually had um, a young musician, uh, Dina Lynch, um, who um, uh, is a, a, a young musician um, who was COVID positive, uh, who has shared her story um, with our district and with the community. And I understand now has being put on an international expert panel for COVID. Um, so we have younger people and older people who've all found this to be helpful. I think for us, the early lessons are that we can act much more quickly and effectively um, in a pandemic situation, and we need to act more quickly and effectively in non-pandemic situations. We've shown everyone we can, um, but that strong local governance supports rapid change. And the only way to do this is to really bring um, all of our staff along with us and using the resources such as uh, we have in Sydney Local Health District, being able to redirect them towards the right priorities uh, with the right leadership and guidance. Um, the fact that we were able to deploy such large numbers of people within days shows you the strength of the public health system. And you were talking about some of the challenges we face as a, as a, as a health system. But I think we need to all remember the strength of the public health system in Australia and New South Wales. That is why we have had no community transmissions in New South Wales, that we have had a strong public health response and it's built on years of expertise in our public health teams working in partnership with our clinical teams. Um, our internal relationships have enabled us to design um, rapidly uh, our models of care based on the best available evidence. Um, and we need to point out that virtual care isn't just a, a secondary um, substandard substitution for our models of care. They have to be integrated into high quality um, clinical care using appropriate algorithms based on the best available evidence that we have. Uh, so, um, that's it for me. Um, I think that uh, we haven't done too badly. Um, I know there's a question in relation to funding models, um, and I'm just going to stop sharing so that you don't all uh, use my emails. Uh, but um, I think that uh, for me, um, making sure that we recognise the strengths within um, the Australian health system um, that balance between public and private, I think, has actually assisted us in responding to a pandemic, um, that we've been able for surgery, for example, to use um, our private hospitals to support us. Uh, being able to get that balance right, um, I think, is really critical. Um, you know, you asked the question about, um, you posed the question about what services are occurring in, in the community, and I note one of the questions was about 
um, the training and expertise of nursing staff within the community. And I have to say, Stephen, I would put our community nursing staff on the same footing as our hospital staff in terms of the their expertise, their clinical competency. And that's what we're seeing, um, that credibility of our nursing staff and allied health staff supporting our patients in the community is why our referrals are significantly um, up. You know, we see over 71,000 patients uh, in our district uh, with our community nursing staff receiving really high quality care. And it absolutely is the way of the future. Thanks, thanks very much, Teresa. Can I preempt other questions by asking a couple of my own? So, you are planning to do this already. Mm -hmm. um, do, did did you learn things that in this rapid implementation that uh, will change your vision for how it would go forward into the future? Uh, yes. So when we started RPA Virtual, we thought we would start slow. Well, that didn't work. Um, and we started uh, with cohorts like our patients with cystic fibrosis because uh, they're a young, enthusiastic uh, group of people. Um, we have over 300 people who are living with cystic fibrosis and they were biting at the bit to do virtual healthcare and Bluetooth, um, peak flow um, uh, meters, etc. Um, and we really don't want them coming near hospitals if we can avoid it. Um, and also our patients with palliative care, et cetera. But I think that one of the things this has taught us is that there are a lot of other cohorts of patients that we didn't think, uh, well, we hadn't really um, thought um, uh, virtual healthcare would be a significant solution. And um, that includes antenatal care. So in the health accommodation, we have a lot of women who are in that antenatal period and some of them quite complex. Um, and again, in partnership um, with our specialists within RPA, um, they've been able to provide excellent antenatal care within the health accommodation. Um, and the feedback has been very positive. Uh, pediatric care, there's a whole range of aspects of pediatric care that we've been able to provide, but also um, other um, management for patients with uh, a variety of chronic um, conditions. I think the older person space, uh, we often think older people don't want to use technologies, but they also don't want the inconvenience of having to get to a hospital, get to an appointment, et cetera. This provides a level of convenience um, for our patients that I sometimes think we underestimate. You know, often people have to take half a day out of their time um, we can uh, provide a much more efficient and effective way of, of caring for them, um, supported very much uh, by face-to-face -face care when we need to have face-to-face -face care. And I think getting those algorithms right, when is the right time to have face-to-face -face care um, and when is the right time um, to have virtual care. Um, our next uh, cohort um, for RPA virtual include RPA virtual fractures, so uh, our fracture um, uh, surveillance, uh, chronic headaches, low back pain, and we're going to be doing EICU um, in partnership with one of our rural local health districts, but also linking RPA and Canterbury hospitals. Canterbury Hospital is a smaller um, district hospital um, and we've often had challenges in having the level of expertise within the HDU being able to link it to RPA in a virtual way um, and supporting our patients we believe will give us higher quality care, faster escalation of issues um, and overall a much more efficient way of uh, managing. It's interesting yeah we, when I was in Queensland which was a decade ago, we were doing that ICU HDU linkage, and it's yeah taken a while for it to drift drift down the east coast. Um, thanks, uh, uh, Tristan has asked, what do you think? Why do you think that despite all the private investment and activity in video, uh, the GPs simply use telephone consults? Um, and I think there are a number of reasons. My guess is a number of reasons, Tristan. Uh, I think partly many. GPs were already doing telephone consultations but weren't getting extra money for it. And so there was some substitution of, you know, people who were already doing it and now being able to bill for it. Um, so they might ring up and check on check in on a patient. 
I think secondly, not all the patients were ready for video conferencing. And thirdly, I think there was some uh, nervousness about, you know, the confidentiality of Zoom and so on, which I think was a bit overrated. But I think there are a combination of reasons. I think we will be seeing a, 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 a significant uh, shift into the future. Mm. Um, in terms of some of the other questions, sorry, I'll just mark that one as done. Um, Christine Giles asked, um, in relation to Commonwealth State Review of Hospital Funding to incentivise out-of-hospital care, um, I'm not sure that I'd, I'd have the Commonwealth play in this space. Um, someone else asked, you know, do you get the, the, how did the funding model work? Well, in terms of the, the, the normal activity-based funding, a hospital in the home patient starts, uh, gets the same remuneration as a, as a inpatient uh, in bricks and mortar hospital for the same DR diagnosis related group. But I think the issue is, I think the future is going to be much more of this out of hospital care, much more of both the, of both the virtual care sense and also the hospital in the home sense uh, where they're more dependent. So virtual outpatient clinics and so on, I think are going to be a big issue into the future. And obviously, they have to be financially viable for the for the health service, uh, but I think into the long term it may change the capital works requirements for hospitals about if we can shift a whole lot of care to out of hospital care for outpatients to virtual outpatients and so on. I think that's going to be really significant in the future. Teresa, do you have any comments? Oh, about that? I agree with you, Stephen. And in fact, one of the reasons why. Uh, I did send that text saying that we needed to start by the end of January was that I looked at the figures for the redevelopment of RPA and the size of the ED, which would be as big as Canterbury um, and seriously would be completely dysfunctional. Um, so I, I think that uh, in with the redevelopment of RPA, we're certainly looking at changing the way in which we see outpatients, um, the way in which we do emergency care, um, the virtual component will be um, a really important complement to the, the other works that we have within, um, within the facility. And I think that, um, you know, for me in terms of the funding model, um, we've taken that very seriously from day one uh, and are working with the New South Wales Ministry of Health around the costings um, so that we really understand what the true costs are associated with this compared to uh, normal care. We have a, a very detailed evaluation that's occurring um, and Andrew Wilson uh, is leading that piece of work uh, for us uh, because I think we all have a duty of care when we do um, when we do these new models and at scale um, that we evaluate them properly. Um, and that we publish and show where we've gone wrong um, and also where we um, have got it right. Um, and the costing study is going to be a really key part to that for us. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Ian Marshman asks, are there any improvements possible via funding telehealth to increase incentives for specialist consultations for people living in regional or remote areas? This is a really interesting and complex question because on the one hand you think, wow, Telehealth is a boon for people in regional and remote Australia because a person living in Broken Hill can uh, uh, connect in to um, Camperdown to the RPA uh, very very easily. But the the issue we have to worry about is what happens if that undermines the specialist services in uh, Broken Hill or in any of the regional centres and people outside the regional centre start to bypass the, the regional centre and, and just telehealth into the into the city. So it's a really complex issue that we, we have to make sure that we don't undermine uh, regional specialty provision by the telehealth. Um, I agree with you, Stephen. I, I think that if we don't do it the right way, uh, and my family are from rural areas, so uh, I have a vested interest uh, in making sure that we've got strong rural health care and if we do virtual models the right way we will have less fly in fly out um, and increased capacity building within rural areas 
Um, so the EICU model that we're working with our rural colleagues um, is about capacity building and strengthening local services, not about taking away from them. And you know, we have um, at RPA significant referral links to our rural and remote areas. Uh, what we want is a lot of our patients who previously came to RPA staying within their, ro uh, their local um, regional areas and being managed effectively by their clinicians with the support of the quaternary and tertiary services when they need it, um, not being imposed on them. And uh, that partnership um, with our rural and remote colleagues, I think is absolutely critical. If you do it the wrong way, it will strip them bare. Um, if you do it the right way, it will actually strengthen them. And it also encourage, I think, a lot of people to go in and live and work in rural areas because they will feel supported. Um, you know, we do know that people like to have colleagues around them who support them, who can undertake MDTs with them. Um, and we were talking earlier about how, you know, video conferencing um, has enabled us to have much greater reach. We can, we now have people from all over the state joining MDTs, um, grand rounds, training um, uh, sessions, tutorials, who've never been able to do that before. Um, in a way that actually makes them active participants like this. We can ask questions now. We can answer the questions in um, real time. Um, and I think all of that is about capacity building for the whole state, not just for those um, areas that happen to have the, the virtual health service. But Simon Judkins asked, transforming health isn't easy. How do we ensure that we use this opportunity to continue evolution, revolution, as opposed to going back to the way we used to do things. For example, hospitals very quickly returning to overcrowding and ambulance ramping to the detriments of patients. Hospitals will operate at capacity despite ongoing concerns for physical distancing and infection control. What are you doing in RPA about that, Teresa? Yeah, I think that's really important. I think if we don't, um, you know, have a mechanism for taking the learnings of what we've done and, and making sure we reshape the future, then we will wasted this really difficult time because there's no doubt it's been difficult. Uh, I think our system has absolutely been turned on its head over the, this last six months. You know, we've gone from bushfires to COVID um, and in Sydney Local Health District, um, you know, again, it's a focus on the right governance, having the right structures and processes in place, not leaving it to happenstance that, you know, hopefully people might learn from this. You, I think in these situations, we have to have an active approach. That means that we have to have the right structures to get the voices of our staff um, on the ground um, so that they're giving input, that it's not only, you know, what the executive uh, think or what our senior clinicians think, but also what our junior clinicians um, and uh, our other support staff th think of, of what we need to learn, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, you know, active debriefs um, to get that information and doing things like we've got a thing called the pitch. So, We've been doing that every quarter for years. I think we've given out now 1.75 million to support the ideas of our staff um, at about 50,000 a pop. We've got a mega pitch happening at the end of uh, June and it's 100,000 um, because we need to invest in the ideas of our staff. We need our staff to feel that they are able to come forward with the things that they've learned from this um, and the strategies they have. Uh, otherwise, we will lose um, I think the the impetus that we've been given uh, through this terrible virus. Um, Bron Nardi says, is your virtual health centre a designated specifically built infrastructure or what is it? Uh, yes, uh, it is. It started with two pods um, and we now have 19 pods. We've uh, tried different ways of, of using them. They're staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and they have dedicated staff. So we have a, a general manager of the virtual hospital. We have a director of nursing, a director of um, clinical services. Uh, it has a proper structure, a proper 
um, organizational structure, protocols, uh, just as you would in a, a physical hospital. Um, but the partnerships uh, with the specialist services within um, RPA and Concord in particular, but also with the other hospitals in our district and with the primary health network, um, I think is really critical to making sure this works well. And could I just ask, of you know, when you say you have a, a patient, say, in, in RPA virtual, mm -hmm. how often would they have a face-to-face -face visit versus a video check-in, for example? Is it every day or every other day or uh, Some of our patients don't have any face-to-face -face, um, uh, connection um, except with their uh, GP at the end of the period of quarantine or if they need it. Um, uh, they're monitored as uh, inpatients, so often monitored. So for some of our patients, they've had uh, four hourly OBS. Uh, others have been uh, monitored um, less frequently depending on their clinical condition uh, and the algorithm that we've uh, worked on. Um, so Tori asks, what were the preconditions in New South Wales to have all the chief executives, the pillars, the shared services work so well together? What can other states learn from this? <laughs> I think part of it is uh, what we've learned from history. And uh, in New South Wales, um, chief executives and the ministry get together for one and a half days every month. Um, and uh, we do work as a team. We share ideas. Uh, we compete with each other. We always like the little charts to see how we're all going. Um, a little bit of competition is always helpful. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think those collegial relationships have really helped us in New South Wales um, to function well as a team. Um, and in these situations, you have to act as a team. Um, everyone's been helping each other uh, with staff, with ideas, um, with PPE, with, um, you know, a whole range of different structures and processes. So I, I think you have to build on those collaborations. They don't come overnight. Um, but I, it's all about culture. Um, and we do have a culture of collaboration and the communities of practice um, that the ministry put into place um, to support COVID uh, with our clinicians, I think has been uh, really beneficial. Um, and certainly that's provided a leadership across the state. Um, I, I do think that leadership is a real key to these responses. And Stephen, you've got colleagues all over the world as, as I do. And when you look at the situation um, in New York, look at Mount Sinai and the number of health workers who have lost their lives during this period. You know, we've had in, in my district no health worker transmission. I think we should be really proud of that um, and proud of the, the small amount of um, health worker transmission that we've had in Australia. That, to me, indicates a success. We keep talking about how bad we are at everything, um, but at PPE, et cetera, we must have gotten something right. And <laughs> I do get a bit frustrated when I hear people say, you know, we're lucky that Australia is lucky. This is not luck. Um, this has been an absolute deliberate effort by the health practitioners within Australia um, and um, our leadership within the various ministries of health and government that's got us uh, to have the outcome that we have. This is not an accident. Um, and certainly we haven't got it right every step of the way, but we've learnt really quickly and acted upon it. Um, and, you know, I think our public health response of identification um, and isolation um, of people who are symptomatic and COVID positive has certainly put us in good stead. Thanks. Um, Sally Forks asks, what have we learned about prevention and health promotion during the COVID-19 response in the context of both clinical services and our public health system, organising, financing, ensuring workplace capacity? I think one of the unfortunate things we've learned is people have deferred some of the personal uh, preventive strategies like screening. Uh, there's been a down, downturn in cancer screening during this period, uh, which I think is really unfortunate. And, you know, we've got no strategies, I think, for addressing that. But uh, Theresa, any thoughts from you on that? 
Yeah, it's interesting because um, I also see that within the community there is an increased appreciation of the need for health and wellbeing. Um, and if you look at the number of webinars, et cetera, around health promotion, around how do we stay healthier, the importance of, um, you know, healthy uh, eating, um, exercise, et cetera, I don't think exercise has been talked about as much as it has uh, during this period. Um, and the importance of human contact um, and how we all need, we are all social beings and need to have that connectivity. I actually um, am, I'm always an optimist, but I actually think that we will see a resurgence of health promotion that people will see through this period that there is a real need to invest in our own health and well-being and the health and well-being of our community, but also the health and well-being of our environment um, and there's certainly I think an increased discussion around how we all have to contribute to having a sustainable environment as well as a sustainable economy. So what we I think what we do know about uh, COVID-19 is that uh, it transmits more in areas with higher air pollution so that's an interesting mm. thing that links all that together. Um, Teresa you mentioned this is from Peter Donlan you mentioned that video conferencing is an essential element Yet I've noticed that while larger organisations can manage video conferencing, GPs largely stuck with phone calls. Is this a technological barrier we need to overcome or how do we best do this? Do PHNs have a role? Well, but certainly speaking from Eastern Melbourne, one of our five key strategic priorities is about digital enablement and our slogan there is Axe the Facts. So um, we certainly want to have greater digital engagement uh, with general practice uh, partly that's going to be about making sure there's the right reward structure, that is the right fees. As I said, it's a market relationship we're talking about here. Um, I think larger general practices may have been better placed to do that, but uh, um, how well placed was RPA? Did you have, was, was, were you well set up digitally for all of this? Um, well, not too badly, but, you know, a uh, $120 camera that you can go and put on your computer um, does give an access that, uh, you know, is pretty uh, cheap and reasonable. Uh, I think that we often think that they're greater barriers than they actually are, you know, and um, during this period, I, I'm sure you've all experienced that. I, I actually had a, a Zoom funeral with uh, a friend from New York um, and we had a very large number of people um, at that funeral uh, from all walks of life um, and it just demonstrated to me that this is extraordinarily accessible. We just have to uh, to show people how to, to do it um, and once they start doing it, I, I don't think that they will stop. It is much more efficient and effective than a phone call, being able to see people's body language. Um, next week, we're actually very excited because we're starting our um, virtual mental health service um, on steroids. Um, we're very excited about that. Um, and that will really complement our wonderful community mental health services. And we believe increased access in a way uh, that we haven't had before. Being able to zoom into someone's home, see how our patients are, look at the environment that they're in. Um, you know, there's no doubt uh, that we can get a much greater sense of what's happening in that environment by video conferencing um, than we can by a simple phone call. Um, so I think that there are so many opportunities here, um, but what we've got to do is make sure we assess these in a systematic way uh, so that it's not just um, a good idea uh, that we feel good about, but it's actually a good idea that has evidence behind it and um, is sustainable. A great point to end on. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, our time has just finished. Uh, so I'd like to thank Teresa for that wonderful contribution and the really great sharing of on-the-ground knowledge. I'd also, I was remiss in not thanking the State Library of New South Wales who are co-sponsoring this as part of their forward thinking series and helped in the advertising of this. So uh, thank you all. all. The um, a recording of this will be available on the Grattan Institute uh, YouTube channel uh, and you can see it there, I think, in the next week or so. Um, so thank you for joining us and thank you again, Teresa. 
Thank Thanks you. Very Thanks, much. David. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.